Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 14689 in the name of Claire Baker on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee on Just Transition Inquiry for Grangemouth and the North East and Murray. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Claire Baker to speak on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Around nine minutes, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity this afternoon to open this debate on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. I wish to highlight the Committee's two just transition reports focusing on Grangemouth and Murray and the North East of Scotland. I would like to thank all those who contributed their views, the witnesses who gave evidence and the community groups and representatives who met with us. I would also like to thank the Just Transition Commission, whose briefings both during the inquiries were invaluable and whose publications support members' ongoing understanding and scrutiny. We know that economic transformation is needed to support industry to reduce emissions, phase out polluting sectors, transition to greener jobs and meet net zero targets. We want this process of transformation to create opportunities for new skilled jobs, innovation and investment. But the process also presents risks for workers and communities who rely on emissions heavy industries and sectors. The definition of a just transition is important if we are to be able to recognise that it has been achieved. The committee heard a number of interpretations and we advise that in providing a definition, the government establish clear and measurable targets for success. The Just Transition Lab in Aberdeen have created a set of indicators, including not just traditional measures, but also social and community impact measures of a just transition. In both inquiries, we heard about the crucial importance of communities not being left behind as the industrial transition takes place. In both inquiries, the community called for improved transport links, quality housing and investment in their towns. They recognised the impact of changing industry and what that could mean for their communities. There was a clear desire to not repeat the mistakes of the past, and there has to be coherent plans drawn up in collaboration with communities, and there must be resources to support this. While two, debates, sorry, while two reports are up for debate this afternoon, recent announcements from Grangemouth have accelerated their need for a just transition. Our first report was into the Grangemouth Industrial Cluster. We concluded our report hardly weeks before Petro Ineos announced the closure of the oil refinery in 2025. One of the remaining large industrial sites offering significant employment, the Grange Rouse Refinery has been one of Scotland's largest manufacturing sites, employing almost 2,000 people. Petro Ineos had said its activities in Grangemouth account for around 4% of Scottish GDP. But this is not sustainable. Parliament has signed up to ambitious targets to reduce emissions. The industrial site at Grangemouth accounts for around a third of total emissions from companies in Scotland, and Friends of the Earth Scotland states that it is responsible for 9 per cent of Scotland's overall emissions. The committee published its report in June last year. At that time, recognising the inevitability of change at Grangemouth, the committee reiterated the importance of the Scottish Government setting out a clear vision and a just transition plan. In its response to the Committee's report, the Scottish Government referred to its 2022 programme for government and the clear mandate to deliver a just transition plan for the Grangemouth Industrial Cluster, reiterated in its 23-24 programme. The Committee is therefore disappointed that the plan is still awaited. Although the Scottish Government is committed to bringing it forward by the end of this year, while we have been waiting for the plan, a transition that looks pretty unjust is happening in front of our eyes. The committee did not anticipate so soon after its inquiry that the announcement by Petro Ineos that the refinery would cease operation with the loss of hundreds of jobs. While it is recognised that Grangemouth in its current form has a shortened life expectancy, if we are to achieve a shift to a low carbon economy, the sudden announcement of closing the refinery was a shock. During the inquiry, despite a number of invitations and a visit to the site, Petro Ineos declined to give evidence to the committee during our inquiry and the committee was not made aware of its plans for the refinery to close in the timescale they have laid out during that work. I acknowledge following the announcement last November, Petro Ineos did accept an invitation to attend the committee and attended in December. At that time, there were hopes, certainly among politicians and workers, that operations could continue beyond next year to allow more time for a green alternative to be established at the site. However, last month it was announced that the refinery will close next summer with a loss of 400 jobs and undoubtedly many more job losses in the wider supply chain. Converting the site to an import terminal will safeguard some of the workforce, but significantly fewer than at present. 
It is against this backdrop that it is even more important to highlight the Committee's work and emphasise how crucial it is now for the Scottish Government to have a meaningful plan, a just transition plan for the Grangemouth area. Recent remarks by the Just Transition Commission are sobering. In July it said, the current path will not deliver. The limitations of collective efforts to date are nowhere more clearly evidenced than at Grangemouth, which presents an acute challenge for applying a just transition approach given the central role of a privately owned company and foreign state owned enterprise. So there has to be greater direction and leadership in the bodies that have been established to support the transition locally. There has been confusion over the role of the Grangemouth Future Industry Board. And while it now has broader membership, and is ministerially led both by Scottish Government and UK Government, one of its key roles is implementing plans that are still being prepared. Change is underway and plans risk being out of date before they are published. Following last month's confirmation that the refinery will cease operations next year, the Committee acknowledges and welcomes the announcement from both governments of a support package focusing on local investment and employment support. But there is an urgent need for the long-term plan. The Scottish Government's own advisory body, the Just Transition Commission, has emphasised that effort to be adequately resourced and approached as an urgent priority of national importance. The Economy and Fair Work Committee echoes that. I would add that delays in bringing forward Scottish Government strategies, such as the Energy Strategy and the Just Transition Plan, Regional Just Transition Plans and the Climate Change Update Plan, have been frustrating. Delays have an economic impact on business, investor confidence and community action. So following our work on Grangemouth, the committee turned its focus to a just transition for the North East and Murray, and in particular the Scottish Government's Just Transition Fund. The North East is home to uh, Scotland's oil and glass production, generating significant economic activity and energy supply. In the region, the sector supports some six, uh, 65,000 jobs. I thank Aberdeen City Council, Aberdeen Arts Centre and the Port of Aberdeen for hosting the committee and for all the community activists and, and members who took the time to share their views. In 2021, the Scottish Government established a 10-year £500 million Just Transition Fund, specifically for the North East and Murray. The Scottish Government has no other regional specific fund, either for the Grangemouth area or any other, and we wish to scrutinise the effectiveness of this fund. The stated aim of this fund was to identify key projects through co-design with those impacted by the transition to net zero, to accelerate the development of a transformed and decarbonised economy in the North East of Murray. During our inquiry, we heard concerns about the future of the fund. £12 million was allocated during the current financial year compared to £50 million last year. We recognise the Government's stated commitment to the fund, but there are questions over its future sustainability, given its current reliance on financial transactions. There were concerns about the type of funding and how accessible the fund is, especially for not-for-profit and community organisations. The use of financial transactions presents constrictions and constraints for many applicants. The committee also supported calls for the Scottish Government to look further at the possibility of multi-year funding to allow for longer-term planning and certainty. The committee also supported calls for a mix of sustained revenue and capital funding, with sufficient revenue funding to support capacity building in communities to access the fund. Skills featured in both inquiries, and the committee reiterates its concerns over the 24% cut in the employability budget, a uh, concern that was echoed by the Fair Work Convention at committee yesterday. The suspension of the Flexible Workforce Development Fund and the decrease in apprenticeships are also concerning. The committee recognises the need for greater focus on developing and reskilling our current and future workforce for the transition, and calls on government to provide greater focus and direction in this area, and for there to be greater coherence across the government to this end. Both inquiries were concluded before the general election, and we now have a new Westminster government. In these inquiries and other work of the committee, we have recognised the scale of investment required and the need to leverage in finance. We await the impact of GB Energy and I would urge the Scottish Government to work cooperatively with the UK Government on the significant challenges we face in achieving a just transition. And I recognise this is a view shared by the Cabinet Secretary. So I look forward, President Officer, to the rest of the debate and on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Ms Speaker. I now call on Alistair Allen, Minister, uh, to open on behalf of the Scottish Government a generous eight minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Scottish Government welcomes the Economy and Fair Work Committee's recent inquiries into a just transition for Grangemouth and for the North East and Murray. 
I extend my sincere thanks to members and staff of the committee, as well as to all those who provided evidence to both inquiries. Now, as we are about to embark on a discussion that will in part concern Grangemouth, it would be remiss not to start by addressing the ongoing situation there following the recent announcement that the Grangemouth refinery intends to cease operations in quarter two of 2025, as Claire Baker referred to. This is clearly very concerning for the workforce and the wider community, and I would like to echo the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Energy and Net Zero in paying tribute to the refinery workforce who have been critical in maintaining Scotland's fuel security over many decades. We are certainly working tirelessly alongside the UK Government to do all that we can to support those impacted by the recent announcement. And that's why we announced a tailored support package, which included £20 million in additional joint funding from the Scottish and UK governments, supplementing the Falkirk and Grangemouth growth deal, immediate tailored career support that will help affected workers, and the £1.5 million joint funded project Willow study, taking forward credible options for low carbon industry at the refinery site. I will, yes. Stephen Kerr. Thank the Minister for giving way. Can he explain a little more about the £20 million, the £10 million from each of the governments? So originally the growth deal was described as the Falkirk growth deal. Ministers have been quoted as saying that the £20 million, from, 10 from each government, is to include Grangemouth. But wasn't Grangemouth always included? So what is the additional £20 million specifically earmarked to do? Minister. The, the name recognises the fact that Grangemouth as a community was always included uh, in this deal, and that certainly has been uh, the purpose of uh, the, the funding throughout, as I understand it. Uh, and I say that because uh, Grangemouth is, uh, critical, uh, a critic, is a critical area for Scotland's economy, and it's my uh, firm belief that, belief that this will continue long into the future. It is worth underlining that there is a wider industrial cluster, as the member knows, uh, beyond the refinery, which we must not lose sight of, uh, a group of businesses employing some 3,000 people. Yes. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to the Minister for giving way. I have to say, I, I was struck reading the Committee's report how prescient it was in terms of the action that was required. And given he has just highlighted the, the wider cluster, I wonder if he uh, remarked on the Committee's report in the same way. And, and are there any sort of uh, issues highlighted in the report that the Government now thinks needs to be ex expedited? Minister. Well, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, government, the Scottish Government has long understood the criticality of that wider uh, Grangemouth cluster, and that's why we made a commitment to develop a just transition plan which set a clear strategic direction for the future of the whole site and recognised the need for that to change uh, in future. And indeed, that was what um, Project Willow uh, has been about as well. But today, I'd like to update Parliament that we have uh, taken the decision to introduce a short delay to the development of the Grangemouth plan. Now, I have to say at this point, Presiding Officer, it's important to separate all these things out. Uh, I've mentioned some of the direct, immediate interventions uh, that the Scottish and UK governments are, are, are making. But in terms of the, the Grangemouth plan, this will allow us time to consider the, the recent refinery announcement incorporate, and incorporate critical evidence from the Project Willow study ensuring alignment between these important pieces of work, as this is, I should say, distinct from and in addition to the more immediate work that uh, we have just described. We will launch our consultation on the draft plan shortly with a view to delivering the final plan in the spring of next year. The Just Transition Commission has said that Grangemouth represents the first litmus test of a successful just transition Scot in Scotland. Although the recent announcement is disappointing, I would like to outline the Scottish Government's unwavering commitment to delivering this, and I trust that members will look forward to engaging with the draft plan in due course. Now, the Economy and Fair Work Committee, uh, to return to their report directly, have carried out an essential role, providing scrutiny of all of these many efforts, and I look forward to discussing the Committee's recommendations and the Scottish Government's actions in more detail and indeed whether further steps might be necessary in the interest of working across Parliament on a topic in which we all have a shared interest. 
We are certainly under no illusions about the scale of the challenge, as we know only too well from our industrial history, poorly managed, rapid transformations cause long-term damage to our society. We are absolutely determined not to repeat those mistakes of the past. Uh, I will, yes. Michelle Thompson. I him, uh, giving way. Uh, picking up on the point of rapid uh, transformations, I wondered if he had any thoughts about the recent Daily Telegraph article that reported that the volume throughput anticipated reduction, which was set at 5%, um, and it is now estimated to be 15 per cent per year. These figures are being confirmed by INEOS, thus rendering the, the, the kind of viability of the Fortis pipeline coming undone much sooner, particularly around 2030 rather than 2040 to 2050. In other words, I suppose what I'm saying is, surely we need to get our skates on even more. Minister. Well, the as the, the measures that I've just set out and the measures that uh, I'm announcing now indicate the uh, importance and the, the urgency that both governments attach uh, to uh, intervention in this area. And I think that uh, uh, the Scottish Government, uh, as I say, have been able to set out their, their part of doing that. And I say all of that because um, uh, this, is, uh, this is part of Scotland's world-leading approach to just transition. And we have to make sure that that is embedded in our climate change legislation and established uh, in our independent body that will adv uh, advise and scrutinise our work. Uh, and we are now setting out to co-develop just transition plans uh, for our key sectors, sites and regions. I, I will have to make some progress, the member will forgive me, but perhaps later on. There are long-term plans to support long-term outcomes, and we have started the journey and must continually refine and develop our approach. And of course, this work also sits alongside a wide range of related work, such as our Green Industrial Strategy, published last month, and substantial investments, including the Just Transition Fund Offshore Wind Investment, the Energy Transition Fund, and Scotland's Heat Network Fund. Now, I want to turn to the North East and Murray specifically, and I've noted the committee's recommendations here too, and would like to make it clear that we remain committed to supporting just transition in the region through our fund to that end. We are currently commissioning an independent evaluation of the fund's impact, impact but it has already provided hundreds of fully funded training courses and provided direct investment into 26 supply chain companies in the region, estimated to create over 1,200 new green jobs in the process. Now, this evaluation will help inform how funding can be further developed to best serve the needs of the region's businesses, workers and communities. We are also providing targeted support to the area through the £125 million Aberdeen City Region deal and the £32.5 million Murray growth, as well as through the Energy Transition Fund, protecting existing jobs, skills and knowledge, while supporting new job creation in the region and across Scotland. However, public funding alone cannot finance the region's transition, and it is critical that we work closely with the private sector to realise our ambitions. So the Just Transition Fund has already directly unlocked a minimum of £10 million private sector investment and the £25 million of funds allocated to the Scottish National Investment Bank has helped leverage around £40 million of additional spend. Presiding officer, it is clear from the committee's inquiries that both Grangemouth and the North East are critical regions in Scotland's energy system and wider economy today. And it follows that they should have a critical role to play in the transition to net zero. The Scottish Government is committed to fairly managing the significant structural changes that can be expected uh, to take place and to support the workers and communities who are critical to the journey that lies ahead. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Murdo Fraser to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives a generous seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by echoing the comments of the Committee Convener uh, at the start and thanking uh, the committee clerks for all their assistance, for SPICE, and also to all those who gave evidence to the committee in terms of both inquiries looking at the issue of the just transition. And like the convener, I think we have to start by asking ourselves the question, what is a just transition? We are seeing a shift uh, from oil and gas towards net zero, towards more renewable sources of energy. 
what we have to ensure in that process is we protect our economy, we protect jobs and we protect communities. And as we are seeing, and it's already been referenced both by the Convener and indeed by the Minister, as we're seeing with the current situation in Grangemouth, there is a concern that workers and the community there are being let down. And what we're, we are not seeing there is anything that could be classed as a just transition. Now, I was not on the committee at the time the committee did its report uh, into uh, Grangemouth, but I did read that report with interest and I've followed the events uh, at Grangemouth that have been referred to all ready. I do hope that no stone is being left unturned by both governments, the UK government and the Scottish government, to look at how jobs might be saved. And INEOS themselves are, are key to this. They are a commercial company, they are a commercial company acting in their own strategic interest. It may well be that the closure of that refinery could be in their commercial interest if they can persuade governments to contribute funds to try and secure its future. And it would be good to know from the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with INEOS about what serious commercial options they are actively exploring, including whether a sale of the refinery rather than its closure is actually a viable uh, possibility. But I want to talk more generally about the issues facing both Grangemouth and particularly uh, the northeast of Scotland, which was the subject of the second report. I don't think we should be assuming at any point soon the end of oil and gas. Oil and gas is still important. Oil and gas is important because we will be importing oil and gas for decades to come if we prematurely close down North Sea. And it doesn't make any sense from an environmental point of view to be replacing domestic production with imports. And we still need an oil and gas sector. Even when we stop using... I, I will, let me make one more point and I'll give way. Even when we stop using oil and gas as an energy source, we will still need it as the raw material for a petrochemical industry, because everything we use in modern life requires hydrocarbons as the basis of uh, uh, that manufacture. But I'll give way, if I can, to Lorna Slater. Lorna Slater. The member, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the member for taking the intervention. Does the member recognise that Oil and gas pulled out of the North Sea is sold on the international market. It is not reserved for domestic use. We already import oil and gas because that's how international markets worked. Shutting down the uh, oil production in the North Sea in line with our climate targets, phasing that out is necessary for us to reach our climate targets and doesn't affect how much oil and gas we import because Domestic production isn't related to domestic use. Murder Fraser. The Lord Lord Slater didn't, didn't reference the point I made about the petrochemical uh, industry, which is still vitally important and will be for many years to come. And if we shut down the North Sea oil uh, and gas sector, we will be having to import from elsewhere the raw material for that particular uh, industry. Uh, yes, I will. Stephen Kerr. Would Murder Fraser agree? that the likelihood of an imminent shutdown of the North Sea as a production base for oil and gas has been hastened by the reckless fantasies of Ed Miliband in this new Labour government. Martin Fraser. Well, Mr Kerr makes this point, point very well. I, I, maybe if I can return to the committee's report on this, because we did take some evidence on, on this. Indeed, uh, Fergus Much, who was representing uh, Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce, told us that decisions were being taken by governments that were damaging uh, the sector and investment was being driven elsewhere following government's decisions. And a good example of this is the energy profits levy. Uh, the Labour approach to the energy profits levy is to remove all allowances according to uh, the uh, uh, Offshore uh, Energies UK that would reduce the value of the oil and gas sector by 13 billion by 2029 and put 35,000 jobs at risk. Not my estimate, uh, Mr Johnson, but those of the industry itself. And the SNP, I have to say, are a little better. Uh, the SNP's presumption against new exploration in the North Sea is going to add to the industry's woes. I'll give way to Mr Hoy. Craig Hoy. 
Uh, Murdo Fraser, uh, forgiving way. Um, one element that hasn't been addressed today is the just transition that will be required in the nuclear industry. If the SNP continue to shut down the Scottish nuclear industry, we're already seeing Hunterson B being decommissioned and torn S. And isn't it the case that it will not be just transition, but what we're already seeing, for, for example, in East Lothian at Tornest is an unjust exodus, where people with skills are going to work in the nuclear industry elsewhere, which is clearly a loss to the Scottish economy and to the Scottish skills sector. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Howe Mr. makes an excellent point. There's a friend and neighbour of mine, where I live in Perth, working in the nuclear industry, who is now based in Cumbria, because these jobs do not exist in Scotland. So all we're doing away is driving talent. And of course, Scotland was once prized as being one of the centres of excellence of the nuclear power industry, and that opportunity has been lost. Now, presiding officer, to return to the uh, committee's report after these interesting digressions. Uh, <laughs> the committee highlighted, as, 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 as Claire Baker said in her introduction, the committee highlighted the delays in bringing forward Scottish Government strategies, such as the energy strategy, the Just Transition Plan, the Regional Just Transition Plans and the Climate Change Update as being frustrating. These delays are having an economic impact on business, on investor confidence and on community action. And the committee also noted the lack of clarity over the investment model required to achieve a just transition, uh, referencing, to, uh, referencing the uh, leveraging of private capital, but no assessment of what is realistic or whether that will be sufficient. The committee spent a lot of time looking at the Just Transition Fund, £500 million over 10 years, very welcome to be administered by the Scottish National Investment Bank. But the committee was very clear there must be clarity about its future sustainability. In the first year of the Just Transition Fund, £20 million was allocated. In the second year, £50 million, but that drops in the coming year to just £12 million. We need to know, and the communities affected need to know, the money will be there. If I have time, I'll... Yes, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, wait. Yeah. I, I was really just going to listen, but I just have to say that I think it's very important that when you have funds like this that are a longer term, that you do an assessment on how those funds have worked. We just think that that's a fair uh, exercise to undertake at this critical juncture so that we can most value for our money in the Just Transition Fund. Martin Fraser. I, I absolutely, I would agree with that. Yes, it, of course it makes sense, of course, to assess if the money is being properly spent. But at the same time, there was a pledge from the Scottish Government to commit that sum of money, that £500 million over 10 years. And if the Cabinet Secretary is signalling there's being a retreat from that pledge, I think that should indeed concern us. Well, she's, she's shaking her head, so I think I'll take that. I'll, I'll take another intervention if I have time. Cabinet Secretary. I think that Mr Fraser has maybe taken my intervention slightly wrong. What I'm saying is that whenever you're putting funding in place, there'll be areas where we look and reflect on the last two years of how it's been spent and we'll actually see where there's been most value for money. That is the exercise that we're undertaking at the moment, because a long-term fund, there might, ha might have to be changes in how we deploy that fund so that we get the best out of it. Martin Fraser. OK, well, that's, that's, a, that's a helpful clarity from, from the Cabinet Secretary, and we look forward to hearing more from her in due course about how exactly the Just Transition Fund will be deployed, because that sum of money is absolutely vital to making sure that communities are not being left behind. Now, if I still have some time, presiding officer, yes, you're nodding, thank you. Um, a couple of other issues I want to touch on that came up in the report. The one is planning. The committee concluded that one of the biggest barriers to attracting investment are constraints in terms of planning. SSE told us it takes 12 years to deliver an offshore wind farm in terms of current practice. We will never achieve net zero and will never achieve a just transition unless we start removing some of the barriers to planning and getting these developments actually delivered. And we also heard as a committee that cuts to local authority planning staff have seen a reduction in those by some 20 per cent over a nine-year period. There is an urgent need for more capacity within planning departments if we are going to get developments actually delivered. And the final point I would raise, presiding officer, is the issue of skills. This is a key component if we are to deliver a just transition, and we need to make sure the skills are there, and particularly with apprentices and young people, there is a focus on STEM subjects. We need more apprentices. Pre-pandemic, there were 30,000 apprenticeship places in Scotland. We're now down to 25,500. We've seen the Scottish Government cut employability spend by 24%. If this is going to work, we need a focus on the workforce, and we need more apprenticeship places.
So let me conclude, presenting officer, if I can, by saying these are two very important uh, reports. We need a just transition that is fair to all, but that will not happen without a proper focus. And above all, we should not be prematurely closing down our vital oil and gas sector. We should be providing employment for many decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Fraser. I would take this opportunity to advise members that, in fact, at the moment, we do have some time in hand, and therefore, at the moment, I can indeed be generous. And with that, I call Sarah Boyack to open on behalf of Scottish Labour. A generous six minutes. Thank you so much, Presiding Officer. Uh, I also want to thank the committee members and all of those involved in contributing these, to these reports, because they could not have been more timely. I also want to start by acknowledging the importance of the UK and the Scottish Government working together. And it's been good to hear in recent weeks the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has been able to work with UK colleagues. And good that both Ed Miliband and Michael Shanks have been involved and have invested the additional £20 million on top of the £80 million in the Falkirk and Grangemouth deal. It was also very good to meet Brian Leishman, Falkirk's MP, this morning and talk to him about the work he knows is needed now because there are opportunities, but we need that action to make sure that a just transition is delivered because people's jobs are on the line now and we've known for years that a robust plan was needed for the future the oil refinery the town the community in Grangemouth and the other industries in the area and the committee report on the North East and Murray could not have been more timely the committee's re recommendations were published Sorry, uh, yes, didn't see you there. Uh, Michelle Thompson. Thank you very much. I probably wasn't loud enough. I wonder, she mentioned uh, Brian Leishman. I wonder if she is supportive of his call to Sir Keir Starmer to nationalise the refinery. About. I think what's critical is that he's been talking to the unions, he's representing the area, and what he wants to make sure is that the oil refinery doesn't just go off a cliff edge next year, which is what's currently planned. So that's about getting the two governments to work together and look at what the opportunities are. And with the North East and Murray, um, it's an opportunity to be proactive. And the points that were made uh, in his opening speech, I would totally, no thank you, I would totally disagree that we're going to have the uh, oil and gas in the North Sea for decades, but we know it's a declining resource. So it's how we use that resource most effectively. It's how we make sure that investments are still going to be there and that the companies that are there are still able to operate and transition to renewables at the same time. And we haven't seen the investment that we're, we're really needing. The fact that Scotland Fund's been raided means we'll not see the investment supply chains in the sector to fill the Scottish Government's budget hole. And that's a problem they've created. We've also had long delays to the SNP strategies, including the energy strategy and the Just Transition Plan, the regional Just Transition Plans, the climate change update. That is having a negative economic impact because it creates uncertainty and it means that investors don't have confidence in businesses and it makes communities more and more worried. No, I want to get on at the moment. If the Grangemouth was a litmus test, as suggested by the Just Transition Partnership, you could argue that we have not seen success to date. And the fact that we're now going to be waiting till next March to see a draft plan is weeks before the refinery is due to be closed. We need faster action now. And I think a clear issue is about uh, the Just Transition Fund and clarity on it faced a 75% cut in the last budget and organisations and businesses relying on that funding are now uncertain about the fund's future. So I think it would be good in the wind-up uh, speeches to get some more clarity on that. Uh, and I think the fund also needs to have a clear alignment of strategy. For example, if we're going to have an offshore skills passport, the Just Transition Hub is absolutely vital. It was mentioned in the Minister's speech, but we are waiting for action. We're waiting for seeing things delivered on the ground. And one of the things that came across really strongly, both in the report that we are debating today and from what the Just Transition Commission has previously reported, is the need to move beyond just consulting communities. They really need action now. So I think that's one of the things the Cabinet Secretary could do in her sum-up speech today, is to talk about how they will work with communities, but also involve them in action that's going to actually happen. And one issue that was mentioned to me, um, and you look at what's in the reports, to reverse the 24% cut in the employability spend, um, that's, that's going backwards. There are small businesses who cannot afford retraining because the cost of courses and the time missed from earning 
through work is a real problem for them. So it's vital that help is on the ground for workers and small businesses who are ready and want to participate in this transition, but they need that support. And I think there's really important issues about how we could invest in communities now, particularly in Grangemouth. We've got big potential and an opportunity to invest in the community beyond refinery, as you know, Daniel Johnson said. If you look at the inquiry report, it talks that the flood prevention scheme, it's not even that it's just not been completed, it's not started yet. So that needs to be accelerated. And we also need to see investment in the Falkirk Council was that Michelle Thompson again? Briefly. Yes. Michelle Thompson. I, I just wanted to point out, uh, particularly around the, the flood uh, prevention scheme, that in fact all these uh, initiatives are being critically constrained by cuts in the Scottish Government's budget. I was going to point out the 20 per cent reduction in capital, and therefore, specifically on capital, can Sarah Boyack commit today to an increase in capital so that these vital projects can go across ahead. Sarah Boyer. To the Chancellor of the Exchequer, as the, as the member knows, the point I was going to make was that the last decade has seen massive cuts to our local authorities and that Falkirk Council is itself worried about that plan. So let's look at the skills hub. Fourth Valley College and the, the recommendations from both the committee and the Just Transition Commission echoes the need to get action now. People's homes and the businesses in Falkirk need that investment. So local supply chains, the jobs that young people currently in school could have in that 10 year plan. We need to see that action now so that we get the delivery. And I also want to thank the committee for highlighting the importance of getting women involved in the jobs and training in the renewables and the just transition industry. That's key, but again, we need the action now. The committee's report on using public procurement are also important. Getting local supply chains feels like a no-brainer, ensuring that jobs and skills don't just stay in Scotland, but are created in Scotland. So there are opportunities, but there are challenges now. And it will take political... No, thank you. Political will, investment and immediate action to take it a reality. The SNP have not done far enough and used their powers sufficiently, and the Tories in government did not even begin to step up to the challenges in Grangemouth and the North Sea that are faced now by the communities, the workers and the businesses. Support is needed now. It's beginning to come, but we need more. Scottish Labour is committed to working with the trade unions and industry to deliver a truly just transition for workers in Grangemouth and the North East and Murray and right across the Scotland. Concluding. Because the other option is continued failure and the people of Scotland deserve more and Scottish Labour will not let that happen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you Ms Boyack. I now call on Lorna Slater to open on behalf of the Scottish Greens. A generous six minutes please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to my committee colleagues and the clerks for their work on reviewing both of these just transition plans. The announcement on September 12th that the Grangemouth site will close next summer is a brutal blow for the community. As my colleague Gillian Mackay, who grew up 200 yards from the refinery, said on that day, all of us in the town know somebody who is employed directly or indirectly by the refinery. They're the ones who are now suffering. A lot of people will be devastated, angry, and extremely worried about what will happen next. I am too, I feel the same. This is the opposite of, a, of the just transition that is needed for the site and for Grangemouth. We have known for a long time that change is needed. Lessons have not been learned from other closures like Longanet. Successive Scottish and UK governments should have taken action to provide a transition that put workers first. Grangemouth is now paying the price of that inaction. The workers at the site are some of the most talented and skilled anywhere in our country. They deserve so much better than the appalling way they have been treated by INEOS. We can't allow local workers or their families to be left behind at the whim of a billionaire. If Jim Ratcliffe had any concern for the well-being of the community, he would be in Grangemouth today looking workers directly in the eye. It is urgent that the UK and Scottish governments work together to secure local jobs and a long-term future for the site and community. Now, Gillian Mackay's comments highlight two fundamental points which allow us the opportunity to start to set out what a just transition is and what it isn't. So far, this is an example of what it isn't. 
Firstly, Scotland's transition to a net zero economy will require some businesses to change, some to close, and some industries to contract. We all knew that Grangemouth, Grangemouth site wouldn't be able to continue business as usual in a net zero world. Change was coming. Instead of acknowledging this and planning ahead for that change, it was business as usual, right up to when the site's closure was announced. What should have been a staged transition towards a more sustainable way of working, what could have been an exciting future for the workers in the community, has ended up instead, yes, yeah, certainly, with the debt, sorry, I'll just finish my sentence, with, has ended up instead with the devastating announcement last month. Certainly. I, I thank, Minister. I thank the member for giving way, and she, she asks about um, what has been done to prepare Grangemouth for a, a new, greener future. Will, will she acknowledge that through Project Willow, and in, indeed before that, um, through other efforts, um, the, the Scottish Government and others have been seeking to work with them to identify just such a future? Lorna Slater. The work is now uh, taking underway in the sort of last-minute panic of this. But we've known that the climate crisis is coming for decades. This isn't a new thing. And a just transition wouldn't have put the people of Grangemouth into such a distressed state. We've known that this wasn't sustainable for a long while. But it, that actually brings me nicely to my second point about what a, a just transition is and isn't. And that's allowing key economic assets of our country to be owned by billionaire tax exiles is a risk to our economy, our communities, the vital services that these assets provide, and to the just transition. Dr Ewan Gibbs, senior lecturer in economic and social history at the University of Glasgow, who has been undertaking research into Grangemouth as an instance of just transition governance, has pointed out that the ownership pattern of Grangemouth is reasonably typical of Scottish oil and gas sector. Petro Ineos is a partnership between a privately listed company and a foreign state-owned enterprise. The 2023 parliamentary inquiry into the sustainability and just transition of Grangemouth refinery expressed serious concerns regarding INEOS's lack of engagement, stating that the company's refusal to provide evidence was a missed opportunity to be transparent about its contributions to Scotland's net zero targets. As Gillian Mackay has said, it has all the hallmarks of a business that having squeezed what it can out of its workforce, knows it is running out of road and is looking to cut and run and to hell with the consequences. The Scottish Greens have long believed that public services should be owned by the public and energy generation and production, which is so fundamental to all of our interests, is no different. I share the parliamentary inquiry's concerns with the just transition planning for Grangemouth and support its recommendations. I have the same concerns about the wider transition to net zero across Scotland. We cannot pretend that the enormous changes that are to come in our journey to net zero will allow us to continue business as usual. It wasn't true for Grangemouth and it isn't true for elsewhere. Change is coming. If we grasp the nettle of defining that change, of planning for it, then we can also seize the opportunities, the benefits of jobs, innovation and new technologies, certainly. Daniel Johnson. The member for giving way. And I think she's absolutely right. There are difficult changes that we need to navigate at a pace that we haven't done before. But that does surely require us to continue to use petrochemical and hydrocarbons. And what is her view about their role in the medium term in our energy mix? I'm actually delighted that Daniel Johnson has asked me this question because one of the frustrating things about this conversation is many people say that this just tra or the transition away from oil and gas should be demand led. But in fact, the demand for energy is very much managed by government policy, by things such as the aviation industry not paying tax on their jet fuel. That increases the demand for jet fuel, manipulating the market in transportation to advantage, the, for example, aviation over trains and more sustainable energy. Uh, implementing rules around house building and what landlords are required to do to insulate their properties, for example, would manipulate the demand of that energy. So 
it isn't good enough to say we must keep using oil and gas as long as there is demand. What we need to do is drive down the demand as quickly as possible. And that means implementing all those other, po other policies to make sure that we move away from fossil fuels in line to keep global heating as close to 1.5 degrees as we can. I, I think the member is bringing her remarks. Because it's very clear that we are about to exceed 1.5 degrees global warming. That is not a safe threshold. That is a dangerous threshold for humanity. I'll, I'll wrap up, presiding officer. Uh, to continue where I was in my uh, speech, no speech notes, if we continue business as usual in the face of catastrophic climate change, we risk not only jobs, but food production, catastrophic flooding and wildfires, loss of low-lying and coastal communities, global conflict, and ultimately making large parts of planet Earth uninhabitable. There are no jobs for anybody on a dead planet. M Ms Leach, are you bringing your remarks to a, a yes, close certainly. now, please? Thank you. Thank you. So I would urge the Scottish Government and the oil and gas industry in Scotland to take this situation of the closure of Grangemouth as a warning for what will happen more widely if just transition planning is not undertaken properly and in line with the recommendations of this inquiry. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Leach. And I now call on Liam MacArthur to open on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. A generous six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start like others have and uh, thanking uh, the committee and all those involved in the production of the reports we're debating, allowing Parliament the chance to consider the issues uh, around a just transition that we need to see, not just in relation to Grangemouth uh, and the North East, but uh, across the country. And I've long argued that the just transition will look and feel different in different communities and in different parts uh, of the country. It will be experienced differently by people depending on where they are, what they do and indeed the aspirations that they have. So I welcome the approach that has been taken in relation to the two reports, an approach that is being repeated uh, in the context of the Northern Isles represented by myself uh, and my colleague Beatrice Wishart. I will turn to some of the island-specific issues in due course, but I do want to reflect on some of the Committee's findings regarding the challenges we face in achieving a just transition by 2045. The focus on Murray in the North East, uh, Murray in the North East and Grangemount is, of course, uh, fitting an estimate. Um, as both those uh, regions and communities are at the forefront, have been at the forefront of Scotland's world leading role in oil and gas for decades. So they potentially have the most to lose from any transition. Uh, equally, one could argue they have the most to contribute, and I think that is the, the way in which we need to approach uh, this process. How we prepare, support, empower individuals, local businesses, and communities through this uh, transition to a renewable economy. As importantly, how do we maximise the benefits for those individuals, those businesses and those communities? And in that sense, I think the committee is right to highlight uh, cuts of 75 per cent to the North Eastern Murray Just Transition, uh, Just Transition Fund, on top of cuts to the employability budget, which will inevitably make more difficult uh, the delivery of training and skills development we all agree is going to be essential. 21 per cent of the UK workforce have skills for which demand will grow uh, as we transition to net zero. An estimated 3 million jobs require reskilling to support that transition. So it is vital, as the committee says, that barriers to up and reskilling workers are removed. And I think concerns from uh, Scottish renewables about workers having to fund reskilling out of their own pockets should also be taken very seriously. Counterproductive too are delays in the government's renewable skills passport, although on a more positive note, uh, I certainly welcome the trade union proposals for skill hubs, uh, further developing uh, the ties between local uh, colleges, industry partners and local authorities in, er in uh, areas like Grangemouth and the North East. I'll give away to the Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. It's, it's just on, on a, a, a point of fact that the, the, the skills passport is industry-led, and I think that's really important to highlight that, that it's actually Offshore Energy UK and our UK, they're actually collaborating and it's industry-led. The government has funded part of it. Liam MacArthur. I think it's a helpful clarification, but clearly the, the delays in the delivery of that passport are, um, are problematic, and, and I think holding up efforts to support the, the, the transition, where I think the appetite amongst workers is certainly there, but the support is going to be needed. That hub support, um, hub approach is, is one I see in, in, in Orkney, um, and I would urge ministers, as an aside, uh, to back the proposals from Heriot Watt University for bursaries to support postgrads courses in the islands, which have successfully helped fill key roles uh, in Orkney's vital renewables cluster, 
over recent years. Of course, the current financial situation is difficult, but if we're serious about a just transition, we need to be prepared to will the ends as well as the means. And that's why the government's handling of the Scotland process and proceeds is so baffling. Having leased off seabed assets on the cheap, ministers have now plundered the revenues to plug gaps in other budgets. As GMB Scotland warned, £750 million earmarked for long-term climate investments uh, no, thank you, uh, have been squandered. Uh, we do not know the full extent of this, but clearly it risks undermining Scotland's ability to deliver any sort of transition, let alone a just one. In my own Orkney constituency, that transition is already underway, as well as being at the forefront of renewables development. Strides are being made in reducing emissions in key sectors like housing and transport. However, these need government and its agencies to step up and play their part, from helping deliver key port and other infrastructure, to supporting procurement of new ferries, development of low-emission aircraft, and the rollout of new housing and energy efficiency measures in existing housing stock. All this requires partnership shared endeavour and funding, three aspects the Just Transition Commission has under, underscored. It speaks to, to the need for co-design with the communities directly affected, again, which the committee rightly emphasises. And here, the Just Transition Commission's annual report has a salutary warning, stating, people at Grangemouth have been used to warm words via extensive consultation processes and engagement from government. However, this is yet to translate into a long-term plan that rebuilds broken trust and provides workers and residents in the town with a high level of assurance and security regarding the future of Grangemouth. We've heard some of that uh, so far in this debate, and it's not good enough. Change requires trust, which can only exist where there's a transparency and shared understanding of actions, but importantly, timeframes. So Scottish and UK ministers must um, collaborate, as Sarah Boyack, I think, rightly alluded to, but they must also be able to walk their talk. Delays to the government's updated energy strategy and the Just Transition Plan also don't help, as pointed out by Murdo Fraser and Claire Baker. Without clarity, people and businesses can't uh, make informed decisions about their futures or investors about the investments they wish to make. It also leads to understandable frustration in places like Grangemouth, where community leaders have talked about a, a, of an historic unjust transition. Malcolm Rennie of Falkirk Council noted, quote, a tension between it being a place that is doing incredible commercially uh, successful things and it having a community that is not benefiting, despite hosting Scotland's largest industrial state, uh, um, estate, accounting uh, for 4% of GDP. Grangemouth includes five areas which are among Scotland's 20% most deprived. That can't be right. Meanwhile, Murray experiences some of the highest levels of fuel poverty, despite possessing an abundance of on- and offshore wind and land for carbon sequestration, a complaint that finds a faithful echo in the islands I represent. For any transition to command the public support required uh, to deliver changes that will at times be difficult, this sort of imbalance and unfairness must be addressed. One final point in relation to the delays and uncertainty I've referred to. Petrionese's announcement last, last month was undoubtedly a hammer blow, but it was hardly a surprise. I recognise and welcome the obvious collaboration that has been between the UK and Scottish uh, Government. Uh, Claire Baker, though, I think, is right uh, to highlight concerns around the delays uh, in coming forward uh, with hard and fast decisions. Meanwhile, when I recently met with the Joint Chairs of the Just Transition Commission, the point was made that we can't afford to wait until an announcement of closure before it acting to develop new rules that help us along the way to meeting our climate change targets. I think the committee has provided some useful pointers for how we might avoid this in future. Uh, but while it's important that we continue debates such as this, we must press ahead with far more of a focus on detailed action plans, investment and delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. And we now move to the open debate. I call Kevin Stewart to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Mr Stewart. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. And uh, like the speakers before me, I'd like to thank everybody uh, who uh, took part in uh, these inquiries, uh, particularly um, the individuals, the community activists uh, that we met during the course of the North East and Murray uh, inquiry. And there has been some debate today already uh, around about what are we speaking about uh, when we talk of uh, a just transition? Um, lots of folk have said, what does it actually mean? Uh, Greenpeace uh, give a very simple answer. 
Uh, a just transi transition means moving to a more sustainable economy in a way that is fair to everyone, including people working in polluting industries. Even organisations like Greenpeace recognise that at the heart of all of this, it has to be the workers. It has to be about jobs. Because without jobs, uh, you do not have a, a, a robust economy. You do not have secure communities. Uh, and this is not Scotland's first transition. If you let me continue, Mr Johnson, I'll let you on. This isn't Scotland's first transition. Uh, we have seen uh, this show before with steelworkers in Motherwell and mine workers in pit villages up and down Scotland in unjust transitions. And we cannot allow Westminster under Labour now to do to oil and gas workers what Westminster did to miners under Thatcher. And I'll take Mr Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I, I actually agree with much of, of what the, the member has just said. And I wonder if it might reflect on that maybe the point is this, is I think we can define uh, what a just transition looks like. But the problem is, is that actually people don't see the practical pathways to that transition now. And would you agree with me that will actually require all tiers of government, whether it's UK, Scottish and indeed local government, to provide those practical pathways for people in, through that transition? Kevin Stewart. I agree that there needs to be practical pathways, and I'm going to come on to that. And I agree that there needs to be a huge amount of cooperation here, and there needs to be resourcing. But most importantly of all, Everyone in this chamber, everyone in the UK government needs to be listening to the experts as we move forward. And I'm going to turn to one of those experts because uh, John Underhill, who's the Director for Energy Transition at Aberdeen University, says we must, um, we must avoid repeating the mistakes of the past, like the miners, like the, uh, uh, the steel workers. And that view, of course, is shared by Sharon Graham, the General Secretary of Unite, uh, the union which estimates that Westminster's current plans for oil and gas will cost 30,000 jobs. Uh, there are estimates from others who say that that might be up to 100,000 jobs. Um, and we have got to ensure that we listen to the workers to industry and the ac academics because they are united in terms of the things that they are saying. Um, and the committee report um, uh, is, uh, is immense in some regards in terms of we have listened, but we need to continue to listen. And just today, uh, we've seen um, a Wood Mackenzie report published, one of many that there has been of late, uh, which says that the UK government has created, and I quote, unparalleled sector uncertainty and consternation and argues for a, an equitable system before the impact on investment becomes irreversible. We need these North Sea workers for the new jobs that we are creating. We cannot have a situation where people uh, are, are chucked on the dole, as ha has happened in the past. We must ensure that that transition is the right one. Uh, and we must remember that £400 billion, pounds, if you, I'll, I'll take in a minute, Mr MacArthur, £400 billion pounds has flowed from the North Sea to the Treasury um, during uh, these oil years. And it is time for some of that money to come back to invest in that just transition. Uh, and we have already seen the Labour government backtrack on its promised £28 billion worth of green investment. I think that needs to be brought to the fore in the forthcoming budget. And I'm Take him, Mr MacArthur. Liam MacArthur. I'm very grateful to Kevin Stewart for taking the intervention. He's focused quite a bit on criticisms of the UK government, which um, I think is in, uh, in, entirely appropriate in some instances. But would he agree that that transition uh, for those workers is made markedly more difficult by the cuts we've seen to the employability and skills budgets uh, over recent years? Kevin Stewart. Um, I, you know, I, I have to say that cuts to employability and skills budgets um, are grim. But the cuts to the Scottish budget from the UK um, are grim. And the axe here has to fall somewhere because the axe has been uh, taken to us. Now, I hope again that Ms Reeves, during the course of her budget, uh, will uh, end austerity, 
and start investing. Uh, and that this uh, parliament, this government here, um, uh, gets a, a much uh, bigger budget than previously. And what I would also say um, is that Ms Reeves needs to look at the energy profits levy uh, and in particular the closure of investment allowances which puts a lot of this transition at risk and puts a lot of jobs at risk. We need resources uh, to ensure that just transition. I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has come up um, uh, with the Just Transition Fund, but the UK Government needs to do likewise. £400 billion has flowed south to the Treasury. It's time for some of that money to return. Um, and the, member, the, me Thompson. the member won't because the member is concluding. Thank you. Th th thank you, President Officer, and sorry to Ms Thompson. S that money needs to flow back. Some of that money needs to flow back in order that we can create the jobs to create a sustainable net zero future and to ensure uh, that we do not make the mistakes of the past uh, as was done in the 1980s uh, and uh, under the Tories. M Mr. Labour Mr. Stewart, cannot you need make to conclude. those same mistakes. Thank you, thank Mr. you very much, President Thank Officer. you, Mr Stewart. I call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Audrey Nicol. Mr Kerr. Well, can I also thank the, uh, our colleagues on the Economy and Fair Work Committee for bringing this debate and for the reports they have produced and laid before Parliament. And as a member of this Parliament representing the people of Central Scotland, I hope it will be understood that I will focus my remarks pretty exclusively on the situation in Grangemouth, because these are deeply worrying times. And I have to say that one of the central messages of the Just Transition Commission report, which has been mentioned a few times already, was that people in Grangemouth and the Falkirk area do not want more warm words. There's no need really, to rehearse the economic impact of the closure of the refinery. But it is worth assessing, briefly, how we have arrived at this situation. The refinery is 100 years old. Not every component is 100 years old, but it has been there for 100 years. And while large sums of money have been invested, the refinery is of an age and of a scale that is no longer considered by its current owners to be commercially viable. And while that is tremendously disappointing, it is hardly a surprise, because the bulk of oil refining is now centred on large-scale refineries, mostly in Asia. And it's not a surprise that the owners of the refinery have decided that it's more economically viable to take it out of production and place it, replace it with an import terminal. Now, I have grave concerns about all of this. I've got grave concerns about our energy security, about using the, losing the capacity to refine oil in Britain. And this is a slippery slope. Now, the global market is incredibly competitive for capital and smaller refineries like Grangemouth. Uh, and because of that, they're losing out. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the member for Gray, and I'm noticing that he's just a few chairs away from Graham Simpson, who I know will agree with this point. Is the point not just so much the loss of capacity, but the loss of potential? Because we will need bio refineries, and Grangemouth is an excellent location for such, but we're going to have a gap. Once it closes, it will be much more difficult to establish such a bio refinery in Grangemouth. Is that not the real uh, issue? Stephen I'm, I'm, I'm going to come on to that um, in a moment. Um, uh, but I, I just want to get the context of these decisions right, and the global context needs to be considered. But I also want to talk about the impact of our net zero strategy, because we have effectively passed laws in this jurisdiction to end the business of the refinery. And you can't pass laws that will, in effect, make it illegal to sell new petrol or diesel cars and vans and then feign shock and surprise when the businesses which exist to produce petrol and diesel shut down operations in your market space. Alistair Allen. He will be aware that the company concerned has, indeed as the member has just set out, blamed the situation on a global one and not on Scotland stopping selling vans that are powered by petrol. And just for the sake of accuracy, he may wish to reflect on what the company has actually said. Stephen Kerr. I think that's a stretch, if I may say, from the Minister, um, because it doesn't go unnoticed by the sector that, for example, the Scottish Greens 
have in the past called for the closure of the Grangemouth refinery. But now that they're getting their way, they come forward with all their expressions of concern for the workers and their families and for the local economy. The fact is the Butte House Agreement created a hostile policy environment for the oil and gas sector as a whole. And that's why it is quite difficult to sit and listen to Kevin Stewart and stomach what frankly is verging on hypocrisy when he comes to expressing his support for oil and gas. Because the SNP are now desperately reversing their previously spelt out positions on oil and gas and their hostility towards it. And uh, the, 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 I will give way because I've mentioned him. Um, thank Kevin you very much. Uh, I have uh, not reversed my position in any way, shape or form. Uh, but let's turn to Grangemouth, because I think uh, it's extremely important uh, that we find a sustainable future for Grangemouth. One of the things that has held back progress in terms of changing the way of working um, at Grangemouth is things like the previous UK government's inability, the current one too, inability uh, to change regulations and things uh, around about hydrogen transportation and storage. Uh, would Mr Kerr agree with me uh, that that needs to move along quickly to find a sustainable future for Grangemouth and other places? There are, there are many moving parts to the situation at Grangemouth. And on that, I will agree with Kevin Stewart. But Kevin Stewart can't pretend to be the friend of oil and gas when the SNP's position, as pronounced upon from these front benches, has been openly hostile. There's a presumption against oil and gas licences. And now we have a Labour government with Ed Miliband in charge of his fantasy energy policies aimed at exist ending the existence of the North Sea oil and gas sector. No wonder uh, Sarah Boyack was unprepared to take a, an intervention from me on this issue because instead of listening, I won't take any more interventions because time is against us. I wish we could, but it's not possible. Um, instead of listening to industry voices about the effect of their swinging higher windfall tax with less allowances has been spelled out, they all seem to realise this will cripple the flow of global capital into anything related to the North Sea. It is a reckless nonsense of a policy. And when she praises Brian Leishman, the MP for Allo and Grangemouth, for listening to the unions, maybe Labour in government should start listening to the unions because the unions are pretty must clear conclude, Mr. about Kerr. where this is heading. I, 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 it's a great shame. I have so much more to say, as usual. Um, but, <laughs> but there we go. That's the nature of debates in this place. Um, look, there's nothing, there's nothing simplistic about uh, transition. And we shouldn't lead people to believe that it will be the case that oil and gas sector jobs, highly paid, highly skilled, will disappear and be replaced by these new green jobs because the track record on the creation of green jobs and higher paid green jobs is not very impressive. So no Thank more, you, more Mr. words. Kerr. Let's see some Thank you, Let's Mr. Kerr. See some... Thank you. And I call Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I too commend the Economy and Fair Work Committee on their Just Transition Inquiry, focusing on Grangemouth and the North East and Murray. And I put on record my support for a just transition. We are at a point of urgency in climate change. And I will focus my remarks this afternoon on the North East, but I very much acknowledge the evolving and distressing situation at Grangemouth. As we know, the North East is home to Scotland's oil and gas production, generating significant economic activity and energy supply. The sector hosts around 65,000 jobs in the North East and Murray, and in 2019 saw a GVA of around £16 billion, or 9% of Scottish GDP. And oil and gas will continue to be a significant part of our energy mix in the future. And like other members, I welcome the opportunity to probe a little bit more deeply into what exactly is a just transition, but also the challenges around delivery, the importance of having stakeholders round the table so we can measure and evaluate progress, inform policy and reach net zero. 
The committee's starting point was to assess understanding of just transition. Common themes emerged in evidence, maximising economic benefit for people and businesses, creating green jobs, moving workers from oil and gas to renewables, very much reflecting an energy focus. However, Professor Paul Delu highlighted the importance of clarifying what the destination is and how we can help people on their journeys as they go through them. He said people have different starting points and they need clarity. He said people have diff I beg pardon, he noted good work already undertaken on the Just Transition Planning Framework, which includes some, as he said, nice bullet points. However, they're lovely statements, but it's not really clear what they mean for a person in the street. Referring to their Measuring Just Transition report, Dr Daria Shapovalova and Professor Tavis Potts from the Just Transition Lab at the University of Aberdeen described a just transition as a fair distribution of the burdens and benefits as society and the economy shifts to a sustainable, low-carbon economy. And it calls for action on providing decent green jobs, building community wealth and embedding participation. And in evidence, they pointed out that there have been two decades of definitions of just transition, but what was needed now was clarity in the planning process, in directions to local authorities, in investment and in building of civil society and democratic processes, and an urgent need to speed those processes up. What was evident from these and other views shared in evidence was that while the North East is rightly positioning itself as a centre for energy transition, to date the debate on just transition has de derived from an industry context. Nowhere is this more evident than in my constituency where a valued green space in a deprived area of Aberdeen has found itself inserted into the Aberdeen City Local Development Plan as an area supporting energy transition. Now, locally, there is a strong feeling of dispossession where development is being imposed upon an already deprived community that feels left behind. However, an energy transition zone is a crucial economic opportunity for diversification from fossil fuels and it has the potential to bring significant value to the workforce in Aberdeen and the North East. What this scenario shows is reflected in the committee report where evidence suggests a feeling among some of a disconnect between corporate interests and community well-being. And I want now to turn briefly to jobs and skills. Perhaps the most straightforward set of indicators for a just transition, but other, as others have said, utterly crucial to it. Key to securing a skilled workforce will be skill acquisition and reskilling into low carbon jobs. Historically, oil and gas jobs have been characterised by high levels of education and skills, and a transition to low carbon jobs will require similarly high levels of education and skills. In evidence to committee, challenges right across the industry were reported and an urgent need for skills mapping highlighted by SSE, who spoke of the need for green energy training academies to make it easier for people to transition from high carbon to low carbon industries. And there is a welcome body of work on mapping skill shortages in STEM and engineering related occupations. And the, highlight, the, the report also highlights SSE's concern about the urgent need for skills mapping. And I know the EOUK Energy Industry Skills Landscape study published this week that, um, that um, I beg your pardon. So the, the report, I beg your pardon, acknowledges the creation of the Scottish Government plans for post-school education and skills reform, but it highlights that this is a critical moment for the industry, governments and stakeholders to work together to secure our skilled workforce of tomorrow. And I think this is articulated well by Prof Professor Paul Delu, who spoke of the criticality of timing, getting people ready for the wind sector where and when they are needed. And as other members have highlighted, this is crucial to the delivery on our green industrial strategy, just transition fund and other strategies.
So I share the committee's concerns to close uh, uh, presiding officer about the suspension of the flexible workforce fund and I hope that there is scope for this to be reconsidered. So again I thank the Economy and Fair Work Committee and I look forward to their next transition inquiry. Thank you. I call Richard Leonard to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by re reminding members of my voluntary register of interests? And can I also thank the committee for doing its job uh, and inquiring into this most critical question of our times? And let me state right at the very outset, I do not believe on the evidence we have seen so far that the transition to net zero in the North East in Murray and in Grainsmouth is a just transition at all. In fact, the workers at Grainsmouth are furious. They tell me they feel betrayed. And no wonder. After the Petro Ineos announcement, the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero and Energy took to the airwaves to say that the jobs transition that she wanted to have will have as little a gap as possible. A gap. If it's a just transition, there should be no gap. There should be full income protection. There should be access to sustainable jobs, access to free education and training, and new and substantial economic support for these impacted communities. And then, and then when the Minister came to Parliament, she described the closure of the Grangemouth refinery as a commercial decision. Now, that is a phrase I regret to say I have heard Labour ministers use as well. But isn't closing down Scotland's only oil refinery a strategic decision affecting the nation's energy resilience and security? Isn't it a strategic decision of national economic importance? Wouldn't the conversion of this site from a major source of export earnings into a terminal for imports be a matter of national economic interest? Doesn't the Minister care about the impact on the balance of trade and therefore on the balance of payments? Aren't these manufacturing jobs? Aren't these workers? Aren't they worth more than that? Last week, the 45-day redundancy consultation began. And can I remind everyone that the purpose of that consultation is to examine the alternatives to redundancy? and so to prevent closure. That's the purpose of it, to consider how redundancies can be reduced or avoided altogether. So I hope that everyone will get behind the workforce, will get behind Unite the Union, who have explained time and time again that this refinery is not making a loss, it is making a profit, who are demanding that the new Labour government takes out a transitional stake to keep this refinery open. And let me pay tribute to the new local Labour MP, Brian Leishman, who has been outstanding and outspoken, calling for both governments to intervene, for both to go further, up to and including nationalisation to extend the life of the refinery. Yes, I'll take an intervention. So, uh, at the risk Secretary. of Richard Leonard twisting my words further in future debates, is what he's actually calling for the Scottish Government to take on the, the, the refinery wholesale, or is he also extending that challenge to the UK Government? Is that exactly what he's asking? Is it, because at the moment, it looks like Richard Lynn is asking for the Scottish Government, given our financial position that we're in, to step in and take the refinery. Is that what he's actually asking? Well, you, now, you, now you're twisting my words. What I said was, Unite were demanding that the new Labour government takes out a transitional stake. But if Gillian Martin, on behalf of the Scottish government, wants to volunteer to intervene in that process, I don't think anybody would object. This, this, is, a, this is a company which in the past has secured £90 million of public money from this parliament, which benefited from a £300 million uh, underwriting by the UK government and it's a company which is now seeking more money, seed capital, through the Freeport initiative for land preparation at its Grangemouth site. So where we have a, cooper a corporation which is preparing to steal these workers' jobs with one hand while reaching out to grab public money with the other, it's about time we started using the leverage which we have got. It's about time we started standing up 
to PetroChina to Ineos and the other oil multinationals. And it's about time we started holding to account the Jim Ratcliffe's of this world. Finally, the Gravesmouth Future Industry Board was set up four years ago. But what has it achieved? Where is the economic planning? What has the Scottish and the previous UK government been doing for the last four years? And that's not all. While it's true that in recent weeks the government has finally published its green industrial strategy, what about the government's energy strategy and just transition plan? Delayed. What about the regional just transition plans? Delayed. Its climate change update? Delayed. Its sectoral just transition plans due out in the summer? Delayed. And it's not just delays. At the very time when we need investment, we are witnessing big budget cuts, employability spending cut, flexible workforce development fund cut, college budget cut, Scottish enterprise budget cut, Highlands and Islands enterprise budget cut, even, even the North East and Murray just transition fund cut. As members of this parliament, we are not onlookers, we are participants. The Grainsmouth refinery is the first real litmus test of our commitment to a just transition. So why should any worker out on the North Sea or at Peterhead at Burnt Island, Aberdeen, Sullen Vaux, Moss Moran, or any other site have any confidence that there will be a just transition for them when on this first test they see so much delay and so little ambition? We've got to get this right. It is the destiny of these workers that should be uppermost in our minds. And so I say to the Minister that there is no time we need to confront this directly. We need an economics where people matter. And we need to build an economy in the interest, not of the billionaire tax exiles, but in the interests of working people. Thank you. I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, my colleagues have already spoken about the North East, so I will concentrate on the inquiry into a just transition for Grangemouth area report the committee published in June last year. Much has happened since our inquiry and the publication of the report with the announcement of the accelerated closure of the refinery at Grangemouth by Petro Ineos. Now, whilst we knew this was going to happen long term, it is a blow first and foremost to the employees, whilst the local communities and the local and national economy will undoubtedly feel the impact of the closure. Grangemouth is an integrated refinery and petrochemical centre of excellence. In total, it directly employs almost 2,000 people and up to 7,000 contractors at peak times through the, throughout the year. The site produces 65 per cent of Scotland's refined oil products, including diesel, petrol, kerosene, jet fuel, etc. The latest figures indicate exports of petroleum and chemical products from the site accounting for 6 per cent of all Scottish exports to countries outside the UK. We visited the Ineos site in March 2023, which allowed members of the committee to see the scale of the site and its impact on the surrounding communities. It also enabled us to observe the progress being made towards its net zero goals. It should, however, be noted that Petro Ineos declined the opportunity to provide evidence to the committee which was disappointing, as this would have provided them with a platform to officially put on record their contribution to Scotland's net zero target. Their website talked about net zero by 2045 at Grangemouth, with a science-based commitment that means investment in reduction measures, change in production processes and efficiency upgrades. It then continues, INEOS will be climate neutral by 2045. At the time of our visit 18 months ago, there was no indication of the refinery closing. So what, what changed? Yes, there were problems with one of the hydrocrackers at Grangemouth, but it must have come as a body blow to the sector when Labour announced it was ditching its plans to spend $28 billion growing the green economy, especially as Keir Starmer had said days before that it was desperately needed and had insisted that their commitment to the spending plan was unwavering and that it would deliver more than 50,000 jobs in Scotland. Now all gone. Well, on that point, yep. Michelle Thompson. 
appreciate uh, him giving me the chance to, to give way because I've been trying to intervene in a number of members today to point out and remind people that the, the scale of the investment required, as set out so eloquently by the Scottish Fiscal Commission, was something that we didn't consider at the point that we did the inquiry, but is utterly critical to understand. So it's arguably, he's right about the 28 billion, but it's not even 28 billion. It's utterly multi-billions that is needed. Thank you. Order MacDonald. Yeah, and I agree with the point that Michelle has just, Michelle Thompson has just made. Um, now, all, now all gone. This led to John McTiernan, a former Labour adviser, to describe the decision to pull the £28 billion of investment as probably the most stupid decision that the Labour Party has made. But let us also not forget the statement by Keir Starmer that he would be in favour of raising the oil windfall, windfall tax and extending it to 2029. No wonder closure of the refinery became a consideration. Mm. Presiding officer, we know steps are being taken to secure Grangemouth's future, and our inquiry considered how a just transition will be achieved in a way that benefits people, communities and businesses in the Grangemouth area. The inquiry report recommendations sought both clarification and consideration in a number of areas from the Scottish Government, in particular what a just transition for the Grangemouth area would look like and how all stakeholders, employees, businesses and, importantly, the local community would help secure a just transition. The reply from the Scottish Government to the committee inquiry was encouraging, with the then Cabinet Secretary providing a comprehensive response to the recommendations, including setting out what work was already underway, including details on the just transition plan for the Gainesmouth Industrial Cluster, which had been announced in the Scottish Government's 2022 programme for government and again in the 2023-24 programme for government. I have already alluded to the fact that where we are now compared to where we were when the inquiry and subsequent report in Grangemouth was published has moved on considerably. However, the groundwork that had already been put in place by the Scottish Government to address the commitment to reducing emissions and the decarbonisation of Grangemouth provides vital support at this crucial time. The delivery of an investment plan is being worked on by the Scottish Government in partnership with the UK Government to secure Grangemouth's industrial future and protect its skilled workforce with a further £100 million joint investment package through the Falkirk and Grangemouth growth deal. This funding will provide support to the community and its workers investing in local energy projects to create new opportunities for growth in the region. Over the next 30 years, it has been estimated that the Falkirk and Grangemouth growth deal will deliver over £628 million in economic benefit, with an employment impact of 1,660 net jobs across the Falkirk Council area. The Scottish and UK Government will provide tailored support to help affected workers in finding new employment. In addition, investment in the site's long-term future through the £1.5 million joint-funded project Willow has identified a shortlist of three options to begin building a new long-term industry at the refinery site. Low must conclude, Mr Macdonald. Okay, low carbon, hydrogen, clean e-fuels and sustainable aviations. Um, we now need a transition at Grangemouth to be accelerated, and I welcome the Scottish Government's recently published Green Industrial Strategy. Thank you very much. Um, we have used up um, any extra time that we had available. I call Graeme Simpson, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I also start by thanking the Committee for its sterling work on these reports? Um, I run the risk there of giving myself a pat on the back because I was on the committee when it did its inquiry into Grangemouth, but of course it was a team effort, uh, a team um, ably led by convener Claire Baker. That report, published over a year ago, has now of course been overtaken by events. We didn't know then that there was a risk that refining could come to an end at Grangemouth, and had we known then, then I, I think our report would have been very different. Uh, the committee has subsequently done another excellent report on the North East and Moray, 
Uh, but I'll concentrate uh, on Grangemouth because that's part of the region that I represent. The news that refining is to stop came out last year, uh, but as we know, it's now been brought forward. 400 jobs are at risk. The future of the town and the wider economy is at risk. So the committee's report, it may well be, you know, it's out of date, but it's important that we have this discussion today. What it's more important, though, is that we get concrete action from both governments. And to be fair, it's good to see them working together. That has to continue. Um, I have to say to the Minister Alistair Allen that really producing a draft plan for the future, um, more or less around about the time when the refinery is due to close, isn't really good enough. Um, I think he needs to bring that forward and we need uh, actually concrete action before the refinery closes. Um, we've heard already, um, yes sir, certainly. Paul Sweeney. A very powerful point about the disaggregation of the finances of the refinery. It's very difficult to pick this apart because Petronios' assets in France are bound up with Grange Mouths. Do you agree that the key thing is the hydrocracker finances taking that offline has really hit the profitability of the refinery, but there's no visibility in what that gap is and how we could make that up with a counter investment proposal? Graham Simpson. Yes, I agree with that. Um, we, we, we do need to look to the future of the plant. When I was on the committee, um, I was banging on about sustainable aviation fuel before anyone else here was talking about it. They didn't even know what I was talking about at the time. And, and I thought then, and I think now, that we should produce SAF in Britain, including at Grangemouth. Um, I was, uh, well, I'd, I'm afraid I'd, I'd, I'd love to, but I have no extra time. If I'm given extra time, I'll take the intervention. It's up to the presiding officer. It's not a matter for the presiding officer. The Parliamentary Bureau has allocated Fine. time to the debate, I'm, I'm Mr Simpson. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I can't. Others have uh, had, had leeway. Um, anyway, um, I was annoyed that Grangemouth was not earmarked by the last government as one of the places where SAF should be made. Um, I am pleased that the new UK government is continuing with the SAF mandate policy of the last government and that the mandate will start in 20. 25 at 2% of total UK jet fuel demand uh, and it will increase in 2030 and then in 2040. Uh, to that end, um, the committee called for, quotes, a price support mechanism for SAF to accompany the mandate because that, quotes, may be required to incentivise private sector investment in UK and Scottish SAF production. We were ahead of our time, presiding officer. The new government says the bill that it's announced uh, on the 17th of July to support SAF production will introduce a revenue certainty mechanism for SAF producers who are looking to invest in new plants in the UK. Scotland should be at the forefront of the decarbonisation of aviation uh, and Grangemouth should be at the centre of that. Now, when the committee took evidence in March last year, Malcolm Benny of Falkirk Council said, quotes, if I were to walk through Grangemouth Town Centre right now and ask people just what just transition means, I do not know whether the term would resonate with everyone. And he was right. But they know now what an unjust transition means. And this is happening because we've sent out the wrong signals. Labour and the SNP can take a good share of the blame for talking down the oil and gas sector. It has consequences, and in this case, we can see them. I have to say, the Greens have been utterly hypocritical on this. Utterly hypocritical. They want to close down North Sea oil and gas, and yet they cry crocodile tears when they, we announce that refining is going to close at Grangemouth. That is hypocrisy. Now, both governments have announced a bit of extra money for the area. That's good. The so-called Project Willow will look at how Grangemouth can remain an energy hub. But you have to wonder what the Grangemouth Future Industries Board has been up to for four years yeah, yeah. if we need this project. The committee called for greater, greater clarity about the role of the GFIB 
which it said was operating more as a forum with limited output to date. I haven't seen any output. That was right, and it needs to change. Both governments need to roll up their sleeves and accept that Grangemouth is an integral and vital part of the Scottish economy. We can't afford for it to deteriorate. Governments must ensure it has a bright future that I believe it can have. Thank you. We move to winding up speeches and I call on Lorna Slater up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, before I uh, launch into my closing speech, I wanted to, I'll use a minute or two to talk about biofuels, w uh, which has been raised by several members in the chamber, and uh, unfortunately I was unable to intervene on uh, Mr. Simpson to, to raise this point. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel is, is a proposal around, based on biofuels. Biofuels is when you, you're growing um, a plant that either produces oil or another hydrocarbon, which you can then convert to uh, jet fuel. The point about growing plants to do that, yes, it is carbon neutral, but it is a, a change of land use. Any land that we are using to grow biofuels is not growing food, nor is it um, for nature restoration, nor is it for forestry and sustainable materials. Using land to grow materials that are then just going to be burnt is a choice that needs to be made in terms of how we are going to use land use going forward. And if we are worried about food security, especially as climate change progresses, how much land can be turned over to the growth of biofuels is an interesting question. Sorry, sorry Mr. Johnson, I'm just going to continue with this point. Um, one of, the, one of my concerns about focus on so-called sustainable aviation fuels is that it removes focus from potential alternative technologies to aviation, which are already low carbon, such as uh, trains for short distances. Uh, Mr Johnson, if it's very quick, I'll take an intervention. Daniel Johnson. Look, I do, I, I'm very grateful for the member for giving way. I think she's right, but does she not also agree that biofuels will have at least some part? I think the question is how much, and she's right about the opportunity cost of, uh, of land use, and I do acknowledge that point. Lorna Slater. Absolutely, biofuels will need some part because aviation will always need to be part of the mix, especially for island uh, communities. Oh, sorry, especially for island communities and for emergencies. Absolutely, but the idea that aviation can continue to grow as an industry fund, uh, fueled by biofuels is not a realistic vision for the future in terms of land use. So I just wanted to flag that up. Um, what, what has been highlighted here by uh, members across the chamber, of course, is that emissions-heavy industries cannot grow. They must change or they must be phased out. What would be really helpful for this in Scotland, and what we need very, very urgently, is the energy strategy from the Scottish Government. And I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary directly when we will be seeing the finished, pub, final published energy strategy. I don't know if she's able to answer that question just now. No, uh, I'll, I'll take an intervention from the Cabinet Secretary, or maybe she can mention it in her closing remarks. Certainly. Cabinet Secretary. So it was our aim to publish the Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan, but we were not able to do it ahead of the, in the general election part of the period. But um, it is imminent. It is in its final stages of going through Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, intervention. And the reason we need to know is because there is disagreement across this chamber about how long the phase out of oil and gas is going to take, what, where it will be, who's going to be affected, when this is going to happen. And we need to know that timeline so that we can all be looking forward and planning. Because a just transition is a planned transition, and without that energy strategy in front of us, we, don't, we can't even start to make the plan. So that's the first step. After that, the next step is to, as so many people across the chamber have discussed, to speak with communities and workers. What do they want? And how do we find that out? We ask them, what do they see for their own futures? What is their vision for themselves and their children? We know from some of the work that the committee's done that when asked, the answers are things like, we'd like to see more public transport. We need more housing so that we can take advantage of opportunities. We need more investment and we need improved skills training. I think the output of the committee uh, and some of its recommendations actually provide to us an expansion on what Kevin Stewart, uh, when he shared the definition of a just transition, which was only a few words. I think the committee's outputs describe actually a it provide a description of what a just transition is, a clear definition of what we're trying to achieve, community and stakeholder engagement across the people, workers, local businesses to understand 
how they're going to be affected, and what their vision is for their community. Clarity on governance, whether that is the Grange Mass Future Industrial Industry Board or appropriate governance for whatever plan we're talking about. Local economic and infrastructure development, always important in a transition. Local people do need fast internet. They need trains and buses. They need connections. They need those, the housing and all the pieces of functional communities. And they need that anyway, even if we weren't in the place of just transition, but knowing we need the transition, those sorts of investment is what is needed to create that economic prosperity. New technologies government funding, and of course, understanding how communities will benefit going forward. All of these recommendations from the committee provide us actually a lovely script going forward for how just transition can be implemented across Scotland. And finally, I would like to set out a green vision for the future, where transportation is primarily buses, trains, people's own two feet or wheels, where town centres are safe for children and in fact everybody to walk and cycle to school, where industries are responsible for their damage to the environment and for being nature positive, for restoring the environment around themselves, where they are responsible and accountable to their workers and to their communities. They are not billionaire tax exiles living elsewhere. Where community spaces exist for people to connect, to be to develop themselves and for art and creativity. Where our energy is provided by wind, tidal, solar energy. Where we can generate green hydrogen to store the energy and use it in our heavy industry. Where I homes must and ask buildings you to conclude at that point, thank you, are Slater. insulated uh, and efficient. And this is the green vision that we can build with a successful just transition. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I call on Daniel Johnson. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Look, I, I think... Uh, you know, there has been a great deal of passion in this debate, and rightly so, because I think if you were one of the 400 workers whose jobs are at risk, you would feel pretty passionate. In fact, you'd feel pretty angry and upset. This has been a long time coming. I mean, even if we look at the report that the committee produced, and it's an excellent report, it was a report produced in June 2023. It has some really good recommendations, but were they all acted on. You know, furthermore, this has been a, a long time coming. It, it wasn't a surprise that this decision was made. It, was, it should have set alarm bells ringing in 2004 when the site was originally sold by BP and again with the change of ownership in, in 2011. We should have at least been asking the question, what is the long-term future of Grangemouth and what is the plan? And I think that's ultimately the question that this uh, paper poses. And actually the ultimate, I think, question that members have been asking is what does a just transition mean? Mean? Do people understand it? And is it real? And I think it's important we get this right, because if we don't, it won't just be three, uh, three or four hundred angry people. It will be thousands, if not millions, of people. Because this energy transition, if we get it wrong, if it's an unjust transition, will be counted in hundreds of thousands of jobs. So I get that. And I think you know, Richard Leonard's contribution captured that anger and that frustration. Now, since that announcement, it has been good to see action being taken, and I really welcome uh, Gillian uh, Martin's comments uh, previously. I think we've seen ministers act at pace, finding additional money, the joint funding of the, the 20 million, the, the acceleration of Project Willow, um, and, I, I, and I appreciate uh, Gillian Martin's uh, observations that, that that showed a marked difference and change in pace compared to the previous uh, ad, ad, administration. And actually, what I would just say on a very personal note, I think one of the things that gives me courage, I, I, I do believe Gillian Martin cares about this, and I think she's passionate, and I think that does show. But I think we must all do better. And I would say I am slightly concerned by Alistair Co Allen's uh, comments that the, 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 the plan has been delayed. If it is published a mere weeks before the closure of the refinery, will it actually do any good? Now, I say that in construct terms because I think what we need to do is be clear about what actions it will take. But in terms of what that transition means, in some ways I agree both with Murdo Fraser and with Lorna Slater. The challenge of this debate is to join those two perspectives. Murdo Fraser is absolutely right. We cannot escape from the fact that hydrocarbons will be a part of our energy mix for decades to come. I mean, to look at that series and make sure that we have that secure part of our energy mix. But Lorna Slater is also right 
that there will be difficult decisions to make. Now, what I would say, though, is rather than looking at aviation, which is just 2 per cent, less than 2 per cent, of uh, CO2 emissions, domestic heating, how we heat our buildings, so the use of gas is non-trivial. That will take years, if not decades, to deliver. So let's actually have a serious conversation about our reliance on hydrocarbons. Uh, just in a moment, and I think you might want to intervene after the point, point I'm about to make, Mr Kerr. Um, look, a, a number of questions about the UK government's position has been raised, specifically about the energy profits levy. But let's be clear. Between 2016 and 2020, oil prices were around $30 a barrel. They're now $76 a barrel. Last year, BP made profits of $38 billion. Shell made profits of $28 billion. And I, just for, uh, ten, and, and, uh, I, let me anticipate a small point here. 10% of BP's profits were made in the UK. That was not, that's not all, but it is a lot of money. And Centrica's profits uh, 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 more, increased more than tenfold. So that is these excess profits or uh, super profits, the energy, I will just in a moment, Mr Stewart, which continue to be made by energy profits, which is why the last administ uh, uh, UK administration brought in the energy profits levy. Now, do we need to get those rates right? Yes, we do. But let's be clear, and some members have said that capital allowance will be removed altogether. They will not. Their level is under discussion. The year one uh, uh, allowances are under discussion. And most importantly, the post-2030 regime are under discussion. They will come forward, uh, as my understanding, as part of the debate. But let me be clear, UK Labour ministers understand the need to secure investment because of it, the hydrocarbons will be part of the energy mix for decades to come. I'll give way uh, to Mr Stewart. I, I, I thank Kevin Mr Stewart. Johnson for giving way. Uh, and he's uh, talked about the global profits of energy companies. The reality, quite simply, is that the profitability of the North Sea Basin is reducing. And the key element of all of this is not just the energy uh, profits levy itself. It is those investment allowances. And what I would ask of Mr Johnson is to use his communication with UK ministers, including Rachel Reeves, in order to get this right, or we will see investment leaving uh, the North Sea Basin and companies leaving in their droves. Daniel Johnson. Well, thank you for that filibuster, Mr Stewart. Um, perhaps you should have listened to the point where I said 10% from BP of their profits are extracted from the UK, 5% of Shell. That's still a lot of money, billions of dollars. And what's more, I made exactly that point, that Labour ministers do need to get that balance right, and that is what they're doing right now. So, but thank you for that intervention. Um, now, critic... Happy to give No. Mr Johnson, you are in your final... Actually, minus one second. Well, I will allow you a sentence to conclude. <laughs> learn the lessons from Grangemouth because there will be further changes through this just transition, and we need to make the interventions now around skills, around investment, around having that plan, otherwise, we will continue to see further tragedies in the future. Thank you for uh, your uh, 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 indulgence, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call on Brian Whittle. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank, first, uh, start by thanking my fellow committee members and all the committee clerks and the space reports in developing what I think is a very important inquiry. I'd also like to thank those who took part in the evidence sessions, uh, both in Aberdeen and in Parliament. I think the wide range of opinions and experiences have, I believe, led to a very detailed piece of work that should help inform the Scottish Government on their approach to a just transition. Now, it's been a very interesting debate, uh, and actually, in, in the main, a very well-informed debate from across the chamber. And what is clear to me is the, uh, on an important point of consensus is there is a need to transition away from reliance on fossil fuels to a more sustainable and green forms of energy, and that the 2050 UK target and the 2045 Scottish targets are universally accepted uh, across the chamber. Moreover, I think the need for a transition was accepted across the committee meetings in all sectors. But what the industry and the wider public are looking for from the Scottish Government is clarity. Clarity of direction and clarity of investment. Business will adapt to a coherent long-term strategy. To me, this is the most important element of the report because time and again we heard the exact opposite. Not clear about the level of funding the Scottish Government will be committing, how to access that funding and who will be eligible. 
We heard that continual delays to bringing forward Scottish Government strategies, such as the energy strategy, the Just Transition Plan, as well as the climate change update, have an economic impact on business and investor confidence and community action. Furthermore, the committee noted a lack of clarity over the investment needed in achieving a just transition. I think this lack of coherent strategy could not be more apparent than the approach and the demonising of the oil and gas sector, who incidentally, presiding officer, are major investors in the renewable energy sector. Investment in the Scottish Government in that investment the Scottish Government couldn't possibly replace. And as my, my colleagues Murdo Fraser and Stephen Kerr highlighted, there is a flip flopping of the Scottish Government trying desperately to play both sides and failing miserably. The Labour Party's disastrous approach to the oil and gas sector, wanting to increase the windfall tax from a whopping 75 per cent to 78 per cent, which will inevitably result in less capital investment. According to I will. Stephen Kerr. Does Brian Whittle agree that the Labour government is precipitating an unjust transition by the reckless approach to the, the North Sea oil and gas? Brian Whittle. I, can, I thank uh, Stephen Kerr for his intervention because, as the OEA UK uh, stated, the, the, the lack of capital investment or the reduction in capital investment could be as much as £12 billion, uh, dollars, uh, 12 billion pounds. Presenting officer, how on earth will these reckless approaches to the oil and gas sector from both SNP and Labour engender confidence in a just transition? It's time that a little business... Uh, just two seconds. It's time, uh, it's, it's time a, a little business acumen was introduced into the front benches instead of the endless empty targets and political points scoring. I'll give way to Daniel Johnson. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to Prime Minister. Would you just acknowledge which party introduced the energy profits levy and how on earth did oil companies survive when oil prices were $30 a barrel just five years ago and now 75 is, is, Where does that fit within his business acumen? Brian Whittle. Tell you, well, the problem you have, uh, Mr Johnson, is that you say these massive profits that the oil and gas industry make, that's what's keeping the... 75% tre of those profits end up in the Treasury coffers. You have to remember, and also, the, the oil and gas sector are the big investors in the renewable industry. And the more you take out of the oil and gas sector uh, profits, the less they have to invest in renewable. And that money has to come from somewhere. And everybody knows we will require this sector for decades to come, not just oil and gas, but the petrochemical industry in general. As Murder Fraser said, it's not just about fuel, much as though we'll still require that. Now, North Sea oil and gas is essential, essential in the development of so many products we use daily and maybe don't even notice. President Office, the NHS could not function without the petrochemical industry. The petrochemical industry is involved in medicines, in clothing, in soap, in fertilizer, in rubbers, and paints, and so on. Products that are important in almost all areas of modern society. The SNP and Labour do not seem to recognise the damage they are doing to the Scottish economy with their approach. Presenting officer, we all know we need to transition away from oil and gas. But so far, all we've had from the SNP and Labour is that virtue signalling that undermines the oil and gas sector before we are able to transition. The target of 2045 in Scotland is fine. What is needed from the Scottish and UK governments is the long-term commitment to those targets that includes a consistent framework that business, communities and education can rely on. We need to understand the investment needed, both from the public purse and the private sector, both of which are unquantified. And, and, as I have raised many times in this chamber, we need to understand the skills required to make the transition and ensure our educational environment is set to match that requirement. To make the transition, businesses and the workforce need to have something to transition to. Create the economic opportunities and business will move to fill those opportunities. The Scottish Government should not be cutting the employability spend something that was raised as an extreme concern in the committee report. That is the exact opposite message that businesses need to hear. And as Murdoch Fraser said, we have a reduction in, the, uh, uh, in apprenticeships. Scotland has a huge opportunity in the renewable sector, and of that we can all agree. But, presenting officer, it won't happen. It won't just happen because we will it to. It requires more than targets and government strategies. It will require consistency of approach, alignment of all portfolios, from economy to education, from energy to industry. Presiding officer. Thank you. And I call on Alistair Allen. Up to seven minutes, Minister. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's has, for the most part, been a constructive debate. I can only think of a couple of exceptions, and I won't be drawn further than that. Um, but I, I do welcome the, the shared commitment that is evident across the, the Chamber today uh, to ensuring a genuinely just transition for the people and communities uh, at these two significant uh, locations in Scotland's energy system uh, in which the committee took such a helpful interest. The energy transition is an opportunity for Scotland. Indeed, the transition to net zero is one of the greatest socio-economic opportunities we have seen for a generation. Events such as the recent announcements at the Grangemouth refinery underline, however, the importance of capturing those opportunities for the people of Scotland. Um, and indeed, um, a number of uh, speakers today uh, highlighted the, the real lives and families uh, that are involved in that just transition. The committee's reports that we have debated today are, are important contributions to that urgent national conversation. At the same time as we support our oil and gas workers on this journey, we look to the future. We will use all the powers at our disposal to make Scotland a great place to invest in green economic opportunities and to make sure that Scotland's people benefit from that investment. And if I can pick up on a few of the issues that were raised by members during this debate, um, on Murdo Fraser's question about uh, any potential sale of the refinery, uh, I do have to emphasise that that uh, is a, a matter for its owners, not for the Scottish Government. Uh, and to be clear, that I can't attempt to speak for the company on that. On, on Claire Baker's uh, point um, about whether a, a just transition fund in the North East would be vulnerable to financial uh, transactions, uh, I do have to reassure her that there are no financial transactions uh, in the funds allocation for 2024-25. Uh, Sarah Boyack spoke uh, helpfully about the two governments working together, uh, and I would uh, mention that Ed Miliband uh, had a very uh, constructive, or I felt constructive, meeting with the Cabinet Secretary and myself. Indeed, one of the very uh, first meetings, the first meeting, I think, between the new First Minister and new Prime Minister touched on this very issue substantially around Grangemouth. A number of people mentioned the, the barriers to investment, and uh, I would have to point out that the greatest of these is access to the grid, and I hope it is something that the two governments together can make progress on. As I mentioned at the start of this debate, uh, we published our Green Industrial Strategy uh, earlier this month, setting out how we plan to create the right conditions for private investment in sectors where Scotland has potential to compete in global markets. We are focusing on wind power, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, and energy uh, intensive industries, as well as our green professional and financial services. And to pick up on a point made again by Murdo Fraser about planning constraints, the Scottish Government does acknowledge uh, some of the issues he, he mentions uh, and is seeking to address them through uh, measures such as our uh, planning hub, which does seek to, support, um, uh, does seek, seek to support the planning system specifically or particularly uh, around hydrogen. Yes. I welcome his comment about the need for more resources and planning. And one of the things that comes across very clearly is uh, the fact that we need more local authority planners as well as the exchange of best practice. And that's got to be an urgent priority because we're not having enough both becoming planners through education, but also they're not being retained by local authorities. Minister. I certainly acknowledge the, the need to support uh, local authorities more generally around the, the issues she mentions around planning and, and do acknowledge uh, the constraint that it can re represent uh, if we don't get that right in the future. Presiding officer, we will use our uh, public funding strategically to unlock growth where we know that we have an edge. And this includes investing up to £500 million over five years to anchor our offshore wind supply chain in Scotland acting as a catalyst for further private sector investment and supporting places across Scotland to benefit from our offshore renewable uh, revolution. And on the subject of places, a number of people, um, particularly um, Liam MacArthur and Graham Simpson, highlighted rightly the needs of the town of Grangemouth itself. Uh, and uh, that is something that the Scottish Government is certainly not overlooking. Uh, to take a very small example, one of the things that we are doing uh, is funding uh, a, a 
community engagement officer to make sure that the town's views are heard loud and clear uh, by Grangemouth Future Industries Board. And on a larger scale, it's worth making uh, the point uh, that the Grangemouth um, Just Transition Plan is only one of many government inter interventions, uh, perhaps to reassure Mr Johnson on that point about its timing. Uh, Presenting officer, our energy strategy and just transition plan will outline our ambition to more than double Scotland's renewable en electricity capacity. It will show how we can deliver our, clear ener our clean energy pipeline while maximising environmental uh, and economic benefits. Audrey Nicholl spoke with some authority about the creation of new green jobs in the North East and the need to increase awareness of those job opportunities. And certainly, as we drive progress in these ambitions, Scotland's vast pipeline of clean energy projects will play a crucial role in the wider UK energy transition. So we are committed, as I said previously, to working with the UK Government to maximise the opportunities for the people of Scotland uh, from Great British Energy's investments alongside the existing work of the Scottish National Investment Bank. And making sure that Scotland uh, plays that role in the future is important. So, to conclude, Presiding Officer, uh, I look to you to see whether you are looking for me to conclude. Uh, you are. In concluding, pre Presiding Officer, achieving a just transition to net zero for Scotland will rely on our ability to realise our ambitions for Scotland's economy. And as I have set out, we welcome the recommendations from the Economy and Fair Work Committee on how best to support those regions most affected by the transition. We will continue to work closely with our energy industry, the UK Government and wider partners to further realise our enormous renewables potential and to ensure that the people of Scotland benefit from a transition that is truly just. Thank you. And I call on Michelle Thompson to wind up. Up to eight minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and this is going to be an interesting departure uh, for me speaking on behalf of the committee. So I'm quite pleased I got the chance to get my tuppence worth. So thanks to those of you that allowed me to intervene. Obviously, there's the two reports, and we've had people speaking about the reports. So I thought it might be useful to kind of reflect on where we had delved into the themes quite comprehensively across a number of speakers, and areas perhaps that surprised me a little in that they didn't come up so much. I think it goes you know, without saying that many of our speakers spoke about what is a uh, just transition, and we, I mean, right from the start with Murdo Fraser referencing the use of a kind of vision, we had a lot of, and rightly so, uh, reference to community, and GFIB, the relationship to that came up as, as well. Um, areas that we didn't really delve into, if you look at the key thematics in the report in Grangemouth, was around uh, the impact on SMEs and wider su supply chains therein, and indeed the kind of wider area. And I often quote uh, about Grangemouth that people refer to it as a drive-in, drive-out economy, a dido economy. And of course, they're reflecting that the wealth is felt in both Glasgow and Edinburgh. People often commute. And maybe that's something we could consider about more. And the last area where perhaps we didn't consider so much was about, we've not talked about e the Acorn Carbon Capture and storage project and green free ports and so on as well, because I think we need to look at that in the round. In terms of the North East, again, we had a lot of discussion about the detail and how in the specifics, um, but again, a, a, an element, a thematic in that report about capacity building, I didn't really pick on, and apologies if somebody did, but I didn't really hear the reflections on how we would do um, that. We did have a lot of discussion, of course, about budget cuts and uh, community and societal uh, uh, impact. The last area where I'm not entirely sure that we had a great... Oh, yes, of course. Claire Baker. It's just to inform the Chamber that we did consider some of the areas that were mentioned by Michelle Thompson. Michelle Thompson was an original member who left for a bit and then came back. But there was areas we did take evidence around capacity building for local communities, certainly, and we took evidence from the Green Ports as well. But... Michelle Thompson. 
Thank you for that, and you're absolutely right. Perhaps I hadn't been clear. I was noting that in our speakers today, despite capacity be building being clearly mentioned in the North East report, North East and Murray report, that in the speakers today it wasn't something that came up. So she's absolutely uh, correct. And the last area that I didn't really hear much mention of was around uh, national. Uh, outcomes as well. So still quite a lot to discuss. And I wanted to pick up on some points that jumped out at me. And actually, back to the convener, we've heard much comment about the refinery contributing 4% to Scotland's GDP, when actually that has been fair, fairly uh, firmly rebutted by Mary Spouge at the Fraser of Allender Institute. She, she notes, and I quote, that chemicals and petroleum production she estimates is 1.1% of Scottish economic output. Therefore, the figure is likely to be much closer to 0.25% to 0.3%. Now, I say that merely as a matter of accuracy, because in reality, the impact of the loss of the refinery, we, we all agree, will be significant. So I'm merely notice, noting it for uh, accuracy. Um, in terms of the, the opening remarks that the convener made, one thing that I wanted to emphasise and put on the record my disappointment as well that INEOS and, and I think it was Gordon MacDonald as well commented that INEOS declined to give evidence in that inquiry and I really feel that that was an unfortunate um, decision for them because it, they then lost the opportunity to put some of the good work that they're doing on the public record. And I'm glad also, in terms of the convener's opening remarks, I also was going to comment that the uncertainty over financial transactions has been cleared up by uh, Alistair Allen. Talking of Alistair Allen, though, and he's summing up, one thing that sometimes we can forget in here as we have our debates, what we are trying to do here is to make sure that Scotland is positioned to compete in global markets in areas where we have an ability to do so, where we can differentiate ourselves. And I thought that was a really, really important uh, clarification. Uh, moving on to Myrtle Fraser, I thought that was an interesting kind of throwaway comment he made about what serious options are being considered in terms of a sale. And I know that's something I brought up myself. And there may well be, and we don't know this yet because these are private discussions by, by uh, companies themselves, but there may well be other buyers in the marketplace. And I would simply uh, reflect that that is a door that we always need to be uh, mindful of. Another area that Mark... Yes, of course. Stephen Kerr? Perhaps she might bring us up to speed. She mentioned at FMQs a few weeks ago that there was one particular buyer that she was aware of. Is that buyer still in the market? Is that still ongoing? Uh, well, Michelle I, I made clear at the time that I signed a non-disclosure agreement, and I've also put in the public record that at the point that that was several weeks ago, the right people were talking to the right people, and that's the only thing that I can confirm with authority, and the honest answer is, beyond that, I don't know. Um, I, I better move along, because I know I've only got uh, eight minutes. I've talked about uh, that. Um, Lorna... Slater, I thought that was a useful summing up and explainer of the implications of land use for biofuels. I certainly learnt something uh, in there. Kevin Stewart always makes his point, and it is an important point about investment allowances. And I quoted a Daily Telegraph uh, article, in fact, I think it was a, a Sunday uh, version, uh, and that was talking from industry. You, you can argue if you want, but I think that's an important point to continue to be made. Uh, Stephen Kerr, I think it was an important point to bring out about energy security, and you can take a view in this, but uh, this is something that, that we uh, need to be, and I think perhaps uh, also were fairly reflected, and that was a thematic that cut all the way through the complexity of what we're trying to do. This is really, really difficult stuff. And so people using the term a litmus test, we are not alone here in Scotland. This is a, a global challenge that many countries are going to face. And maybe sometimes we can forget that when we're having uh, our debates. Um, Richard Leonard, I think, uh, gave a characteristically spirited contribution, which I always enjoy. And Gordon MacDonald gave his usual kind of calm reflections on, on matters. 
Uh, Graham, I would certainly put it on Graham Simpson, put it on record that I was with him in the discussions about sustainable aviation fuel, uh, and it's something that we'll uh, continue to consider. So, all in all, presiding officer, I found it a most enjoyable uh, debate. I'm glad I got my tuppence worth in the interventions, uh, but that was my summing up on behalf of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Thompson. Uh, given the time, I will I thank Ms Thompson for winding up the debate on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee. Um, the debate obviously was on the Just Transition Inquiry from, for, on, for Grangemouth and the North East and Murray, and obviously involved members from across the Parliament and the Committee. And, I think it's fair to say that the debate was a very interesting one. Um, and the point of order, Daniel Johnson. Uh, am I correct in saying that uh, the business uh, uh, and standing order is set at the exact time of decision time, which always provides a, a little bit of an awkward moment to ensure that we actually have decision time at the correct time. I'd really uh, very much welcome your guidance on this matter at this time, presiding officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. That was a very interesting point you raised, and I will get back to you on it at a later date. However, for this moment, it is time to move on to the next item of business. And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. And the question is that motion 14689, in the name of Claire Baker, on behalf of the Economy and Fair Work Committee on Just Transition Inquiry for Grangemouth and the North East and Murray, be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. That concludes decision time, and I close this meeting.